Thank you for joining the webinar, Where is Security Headed in 2018 and Beyond? A few housekeeping items before we begin. This webinar is being recorded, and all registrants will receive access to that recording. Please type in your questions as you have them. We have left time for end at the end for questions. With us today, we have Information Security Research Director Scott Crawford and Nate Carroll with Blue Vector. Scott Crawford is the Research Director for the Information Security Channel at 451 Research, where he leads coverage of emerging trends, innovation, and disruption in the information security market. Well known as an industry analyst covering information security, prior to joining 451 Research, Scott has experience as both a vendor and an information security practitioner. Nate Carroll is a security solutions architect for Blue Vector's Threat Intelligence Research Team. Mr. Carroll has eight years of cybersecurity experience following a decade of distinguished service as a counterintelligence special agent. Prior to this position, Nate provided incident response training and security consultations for the Department of Defense Computer Network and Fortune 100 companies. And with that, I'll pass it off uh, to you guys, Scott and Nate. All right, Chelsea, thank you very much, and hello, everybody. Uh, this is Scott Crawford, 451 Research with you today. And before we take a look at where uh, we're going in 2018, uh, we needed to take a look back at where we come from, because that's going to set the stage for where, in the attack landscape at least anyway, we expect to see how we expect to see things unfold in the coming year. And looking backwards, uh, gosh, it seems to be a recurrent story every year, but just breaches continue to uh, just skyrocket in terms of the number of records breached. In fact, in this past year, we've actually broke, uh, broken some records. Um, the Yahoo breach alone. Prior to uh, the disclosure of the Yahoo breach, which was actually disclosed towards the end of 2016, um, there were nearly, the Privacy Rights Clearinghouse was uh, tracking nearly a billion records breached and a little over 5,000 breaches. That number has risen to over 7,000, approaching 8,000 or may have exceeded it by now. And the Yahoo breach alone took that total initially, added another uh, one and a half billion to that total, and that total was again revised upwards to include uh, nearly uh, all three, or rather did include all three billion or more uh, uh, account records of Yahoo users uh, in a revision of the total records breached that was disclosed by Yahoo in the first week of uh, October, just a few weeks ago. Uh, so that and a number of high-profile breaches, not least including, of course, the Equifax breach, which has, uh, which has exposed the personal information, couldn't be more personal financial information. Uh, affecting individuals, uh, mostly in North America, but also having an impact felt around the world. Um, and that's linking with some other trends that we're going to see setting the stage for information security in 2018 with the rise of increased emphasis on data privacy regulation in Europe, particularly with the general data protection regulation entering into force in May. So this past year has already been something of a record year. Granted, while the number of records has effectively tripled, number of breach records has effectively tripled, in the last year. There are a few high-profile breaches that really call that out. But at the same time, we see some trends that have become fairly predominant across the landscape that we expect to continue to see setting uh, trends and setting the pace for uh, security and response going into 2018. Chelsea, if we could move to the next slide. Of course, we've seen ransomware having a dramatic impact on way that organizations respond to information security threats in the last several months. Looking back a little over a year ago, we'd seen steady growth that really accelerated over the course of 2015-2016. Um, we had seen a growth of a little over one and a half times in the total amount of ransomware in 2015, with the average ransom going from a little under $300 to nearly $700 in 2016 according to Symantec, and then the number of attacks per day going from about 1,000 in 2015 to roughly 4,000 in 2016, 2016, according to a U.S. government interagency report. Um, some were tracked uh, more than 100% year-over-year growth in the total number of ransomware variants just in 2016, but the total volume of ransomware has grown over seven times, uh, according to some, in the last year. So if there's a theme with ransomware and in the trends that we've seen just in this past year alone, 
I think one thing I'd have to call out is efficiency in, on the part of the attacker, and that's something that we expect to set the stage going into 2018 as well, too. Nowhere have we seen that more evident in the three most significant attacks of 2017, that, uh, at least in terms of capturing headlines, beginning with WannaCry, which broke out in May. And the biggest distinction in WannaCry from prior attacks uh, of the ransomware variety is that WannaCry was really distinguished as being more of a worm, targeting the uh, SMBV1 vulnerability that was targeted by the Eternal Blue exploit, which had itself been stolen from the NSA in a breach of the NSA's uh, trove of wares early this year, uh, made public in April by the Shadow Brokers Group. And Eternal Blue targeting Windows vulnerabilities in the server message block in version 1.0 of SMB that weren't publicly known until March, which is a month before the Shadow Broker's disclosure. Uh, so this suggests uh, a fairly high degree of sophistication in terms of keeping track of exploits available uh, that could be targeted and could be capitalized on to increase the efficiency of attacks. This worm-type variant that was able to discover this vulnerability on networks and spread itself accordingly. Um, had been patched by Microsoft early this year, but still the prevalence of it um, affected more than 300,000 victims in over 150 countries over the course uh, of a single weekend. Then in June, we saw uh, the Petya or not Petya variants uh, appear, which also capitalized on the eternal blue exploit, hitting about 300,000 computers around the world um, and again, this worm type variant, I mean, the outbreaks of worms that we hadn't seen quite this prevalent for several years, going back to the early 2000s, really. But now we see attackers capitalizing on this approach to efficiency in terms of spread and the Petya, not Petya variants targeting uh, entire hard drives by overriding the master boot record. There's indication in the Petya, not Petya case that the objective may have been more to cause havoc. This is very sophisticated ransomware that was apparently equipped with some very basic and non-automated functions for accepting ransom payments that led some to suggest that money wasn't really the goal here. And really affected were some very large organizations like the shipping and supply vessel operator Maersk and FedEx, both with estimated losses of around 300 million due to the impact of the Petya, not Petya variants. And lastly, the outbreak of Bad Rabbit uh, in October, yet another variant of Petya, but this time it was the Eternal Romance uh, vulnerability and exploit rather than Eternal Blue that was uh, targeted in this case, affecting particularly Russian and Ukraine targets, including the Kiev metro system and the Odessa International Airport. The vector in this case was uh, drive-by downloads, at least initially, on compromised websites. Um, and users are being manipulated as well, too, always a constant in our world, unfortunately. Users being told that they had to install a phony flash update, which wound up dropping the malware. They had Rabbit sharing much of its code, roughly two-thirds of it, with Petya and uh, some researchers concluding that this combined with how it used the SMB exploits meant that there was a fairly high confidence among many researchers in a link between those two forms of ransomware. So this is kind of the theme that we see set for us going into 2018. The increase of this type of attack, its continued prevalence. And um, Nate, I'm assuming that, you know, from Blue Vector's perspective, this is pretty much what you're seeing and anticipating going into 2018 as well. Would that be a, a fair statement? Yes, Scott. You know, for me, what really wasn't the amount of breaches or even how it was done. Rather, as you mentioned earlier, the sheer impact on the victim's business operations, you know, uh, you know, especially, as you said, notably in pharmaceuticals and shipping, we've seen organizations' core business functions just paralyzed. And I really think that should have them reflect on whether or not their current security controls are actually benefiting the business or if they need to rethink their approach. Uh, with regards to ransomware, destructive malware, or even the low-budget, you know, ransom scareware that doesn't even install anything, just kind of prompts or fakes out the user to an uh, some payment, uh, you know, those are obviously not going anytime soon in 2018. Uh, but really, for me, for a couple of years, we've been told to expect it to pop up on other systems, and that's kind of what I'm waiting to see. Uh, you know, the uh, ransomware on, for example, your Android-based smart television or refrigerators, vehicle infotainment center uh, systems, and even environmental control systems. 
Um, ultimately, you know, it's not only the target scope will expand, but also the attacker's ability to deliver malware that is undetectable by traditional inspection. I, I think we're going to talk about that in a few slides. We are. In fact, uh, Chelsea, if we move to the next slide now, we're going to talk about one of the most significant factors that we see uh, with respect to the opportunities that attackers are capitalizing on. And it's just that, you know, IT, def defending IT and maintaining it against threats, it's just hard. And there's been a lot of fingers pointed at, well, you know, systems weren't updated, weren't kept up to date, weren't patched, weren't updated with more current versions of supported operating systems, for example. Nay, you mentioned, you know, in some of the uh, industrial or operational technology cases, uh, and I'll come back to that here in a moment, but, you know, even when systems are amenable to being kept up to date, it's not always that straightforward. When people are having to deal with these long laundry lists and vulnerabilities, when it comes to patching endpoints, they have to deal with a very distributed environment, prioritizing those that need to be remediated most significantly first. And we often think about this in connection with the endpoint, but in the case of the Equifax breach, that was actually a well-publicized vulnerability in an application framework, in, the, in Apache Struts to be specific, which you know, a lot of people were saying, well, you know, the patch for that was, uh, it was patched in March, and the vulnerability was publicized in the early half, in the first half of this year. So why is it still so prevalent? Well, anyone who's tried to maintain an application architecture uh, on the server side for today's complex web applications, particularly if there's a significant amount of dependence on the business in their availability or performance for, you know, at a minimum, revenue-generating applications, that's not trivial. You cannot simply swap out an application framework in a matter of days and expect there to not be any issues with the application itself. In some cases, the application may be, need to be rebuilt, retooled for the new dependencies on those underlying frameworks. So it's not terribly surprising to see attackers going after these difficult to remediate issues like the struts vulnerability in that case. And then in WannaCry, you know, we talked about the fact that the uh, SMB vulnerability was, is very old and that some very out-of-date operating systems were affected. But in some cases, and, and this even relates to like conflict. I mean, this, these, some of these are cases where you can't update or patch them very readily or very quickly in the cases of, say, medical devices, for example, they may have to go through some clinical proving in order to demonstrate that any updates or changes are not going to have a clinical impact on patient welfare, for example. There may be other reasons why they're difficult to patch or maintain. For industrial or operational controls, they may be, there may be operational dependencies that you just simply can't take these systems online. You could cause real problems in a process industry, in a utility for health and safety reasons. So um, I'm, I'm assuming probably, Nate, you're seeing a lot of the same thing in terms of, you know, operational technology deployments. And has this been something that you've seen uh, more of an uptick at Blue Vector this last year? Yes, you know, and I really expect the trend of insecure vulnerable protocols and poorly implemented permission-based systems, like you were uh, stating with file shares and things of that nature, to continue uh, to be targeted as they're really low-hanging fruit. And I think that can be said for any malware that targets, you know, any vulnerability, regardless if it's a, uh, within a protocol, system architecture, or even an organization's process. Uh, you know, security staff are quick to kind of negate signature-based detection. I hear that a lot. But uh, as you mentioned, Conficker is one of those examples where detection for commodity malware will just save you time in system restoration or baselining activities especially in an industrial settings where it's still one of the most impactful uh, pieces of malware that can affect these legacy-based systems. Um, so I think it's important to have a detection platform that provides not only next-gen detection but also ingest signatures, uh, especially if it's, you know, something that your own threat intelligence team is building uh, based upon, you know, the data from their own targeted attacks. Uh, you know, as you brought up, you know, control systems, things of that nature, Scott, uh, a lot of these systems, especially when we look at large, um, well, what is now becoming, you know, internet-connected large generation platforms, uh, a lot of times organizations can't uh, even touch those systems because of warranties that they have with, uh, with the manufacturer. Um, and as uh, those devices get smaller and smaller, the same type of constraints, whether it's uh, warranty-based or even, you know, firmware limitations, uh, they, they just don't have the ability to deal with. Right. So, Chelsea, let's move to the next slide. 
So in terms of what we expect to see in 2018, we must remember we're dealing with an intelligent adversary, and therefore they're going to be looking for targets of opportunity. Where can they have the most impact, well, for achieving specific objectives at least anyway, with the minimum amount of effort, expense, and exposure for themselves? So well-publicized dependencies are dependencies on which, for which remediation is not straightforward, not simple, and therefore likely to take a long time. Uh, as in the case of application uh, platforms and frameworks. So I would be on the lookout for those types of vulnerabilities when they become public or, or at least known. And that ups the ante on, you know, for organizations that do develop and maintain their own applications, what they have to do to, in terms of investing those applications to make sure they're secure, particularly with respect to uh, underlying dependencies. And then in more distributed environments, what does it mean in your distributed environment if you have difficulty or issues with keeping those systems updated for security purposes. If it's not feasible or practical, you're going to have to think of alternative ways to protect those types of systems. And as we go to the next slide, we're going to see that that's going to keep uh, a focus on defense. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about maintaining good hygiene for these environments. But even when it's feasible, it can be very time consuming and place a lot of demand on organizational personnel. And we'll come back to the personnel aspect of that here in a minute when we come back to talking about uh, efficiencies. But one of the things this does imply is keeping a focus on defense. And one of the issues that we've seen with defense historically is that defenses have tended to be fairly static. Signatures, excuse me, signatures have a place in terms of being very specific about recognizing certain types of attacks and attack variants. But they can also be very static, and they can not be terribly resilient when it comes to changes in attack behavior, attacker tactics and methods, and recognizing malicious behavior when it's encountered. Uh, defenses have also suffered from having been too late, too reactive, and not able to recognize and defeat attacks before they have an impact on the target. And yet another issue we've seen in defense is that they tend to be too fragmented. Uh, we have a lot of silos in security technologies, and that limits the ability of this, these technologies to come together and recognize the multiple aspects of the context, uh, particularly more uh, complex attacks, initial penetration using specific tactics such as phishing or malware may be followed by um, the capture of account privileges, the exploit of a specific user account, uh, privilege escalation, lateral movement, uh, attacker surveying the environment once they're within an environment for more uh, higher priority objectives and moving laterally towards those objectives. And we've, you know, largely been stymied in a lot of these efforts for any number of reasons. But this is also one reason why we go on to the next slide. We're expecting in 2018 to see analytics become a key aspect of security technology pretty much across the board. In fact, our expectation, our expectation at 451 is that virtually every security vendor will be a vendor of analytics or analytics will be incorporated into security products in some form or another. We already see this. Uh, fairly pervasive in segments beyond the traditional areas where we expect analytics to uh, have an impact, such as security operations, management, and SIM. We're seeing it become particularly prevalent in endpoint technologies. We see it in analytic technologies that often come alongside SIM investments in SOC operations, such as user behavior analytics. But we expect to see it penetrate more broadly across the security spectrum. We see this actually in a lot of technologies just beyond security. But, you know, it's fairly obvious why we would be seeing this. And then we talked about the threat landscape, uh, the inability to respond quickly or effectively enough, but also the sheer scale of what security teams are up against in terms of just the number of attacks, the volume of attacks and threat landscape, uh, the, the accuracy of threat modeling for a given organization, uh, the dependence on human personnel in order to correlate this information and do the most effective job in recognizing the threats. So there's a lot to be said for the advantages of, of uh, analytics and security, but as we move to the next slide, there's issues that we have to keep in mind and that we'll be looking for in terms of what we're seeing in 2018 here at 451 
in terms of the integration of analytics in security technologies and techniques. There are definitely things that they can do. They can distinguish patterns. They can recognize anomalies and deviations from norms. They can do so at scale and typically faster than people can, provided that they're accurate enough to be effective. And when they're effective at doing that, there is the potential they introduce of freeing people to focus on what people can do better than machines and recognizing the changing tactics of an intelligent adversary and recognizing the adversary's motivations and tuning the accuracy of threat modeling for a given organization to improve visibility and response into certain types of threats that may be more at issue for some organizations than others. But at the same time, as we head into 2018, we'll also be looking for what analytics can't or really shouldn't do for one thing, they really can't create more work for people by overwhelming them with information. And this is one of the issues we've seen in terms of uh, not just, you know, analytics and, and the generation of security data by security tools, but in areas like threat intelligence as well, too. It's fantastic to have insight in the nature of the threat landscape, but how do you actually put that to work in defense? So analytics coupled with ways to engage uh, insight more directly and more effective, more responsive defense, including embracing technologies of automation. These are two things that we expect to see go hand in hand uh, very prominently in 2018. Uh, analytics also cannot respond too little, too poorly, or too late. Um, they can provide information in terms of the context of attack and in terms of understanding incident uh, breaking down an incident for forensic analysis and for response, but when it comes to actually augmenting defense and protection, they will have to be able to keep up with the attack landscape as much as possible and be able to be proactive and interventive, if you will, in defeating attacks before they have an impact on the target or the targeted organization. Lastly, they really shouldn't be in a position of attempting to do what people can frankly do better. Instead, focusing on what machines can do better than people and relieving people to do what they can do best. Now, this often begs the question of, you know, what's the direction we anticipate for artificial intelligence? Well, for one thing, that's still a fairly expansive concept, and there's two terms that are used an awful lot in security. It's machine learning and artificial intelligence. But even in more sophisticated uh, AI uh, implementations these days, the same sort of AI that might be good that becoming a Go champion, for example, may not be so adept at opening, a, of opening a door or picking up an object. So we have quite a ways to go before we see generalized AI reach a par with humans in terms of its, uh, its ability to discern, judge, and make more sophisticated decisions. In the meantime, there's much that can be done to alleviate people of repetitive tasks, of tasks that machines are well adapted to do and can do faster and at scale better than people can. So these are the areas where we expect to see analytics uh, focused in terms of their application to security uh, in 2018. And uh, Nate, I expect you have some pretty specific things to say about how Blue Vector is taking on this challenge. Absolutely. Can we go ahead and go to the next slide, please? Great. Thanks. Uh, so you know, kind of looking at how we how we do things. You know, first and foremost, unless your security budget matches what's spent on offensive capabilities by cyber groups, you're going to need to automate and gain efficiencies where you can. Um, that often means empowering the more junior team members so your seasoned folks can tackle the large problems. Uh, but in the last few years, you know, we've seen a large organization embrace network analytics, as well as uh, both forms of supervised and unsupervised machine learning. Um, you know, uh, looking at the advantages of supervised machine learning and not getting into the specifics because we have uh, a lot of blog posts out there at bluevector.io um, as well as some other talks about the subject. Uh, but I kind of want to show what really what our implementation of uh, supervised machine learning looks like and some of the advantages. And essentially from an efficiencies perspective, um, we're spotting threats 13 months before uh, they're actually being published um, using, using our regression testings and things of, that, uh, of those uh, models and those natures. Uh, so you can kind of see uh, from the center of this uh, diagram, uh, the center being where the, uh, the threat was first publicly identified, and then uh, in scale in months, um, radiating out where you can see where not only we see certain um, uh, threats, but even as they start to uh, uh, start to morph. Um, so that's kind of where I'll, I'll, I'll leave off on supervised machine learning, um, but I'd really kind of going back to the previous slide and what you said, Scott, uh, with regards to analytics and security, 
Uh, I think now is the time for more junior members um, and those people that are really familiar with uh, the technology to kind of jump forward and start to embrace it. Um, you don't need a big uh, data Hadoop cluster to start seeing the benefits of analytics and machine learning. Um, if any of our guests today attended BroCon this year, they saw an increase in focus giving the machine learning, uh, specifically with regards to packets. And uh, Bro Platform's uh, metadata can be enriched by uh, data mining and analysis tools that are freely available, such as Scikit-Learn, and there are even a few published notebooks out there to get uh, organizations started. That's a really good point, Nate, and uh, that's something we talk about a lot in terms of you know, we see a lot of organizations that, on the one hand, they seize the opportunity and really throw themselves into it. On the other hand, some that kind of cringe a little bit about what does this mean for the type of expertise that we need on our team, what do we need to guide our teams and where do we need to guide them in developing expertise. And a tendency to want to bite off, you know, more than they can chew, at least initially. But you're right. There's ways that you can begin embracing these approaches more incrementally, build familiarity with how the tools incorporate them, and same for automation. You don't necessarily have to invest in, in, in a very expensive automation platform to recognize the advantages. For a security professional, particularly, a better understanding how to manipulate and use things like Python and automating the integration of security technologies with each other. So one of the uh, points of guidance that we're suggesting for security pros going into 2018 is become more familiar uh, with, the, with machine learning techniques uh, so that you can become a better and more discriminating customer yourself when the term is used and you can recognize and ask the right questions of your suppliers as far as how they employ techniques and how they can demonstrate the effectiveness of those techniques in your setting. And the same for automation. Uh, begin to become familiar with the skills necessary. I mean, start doing some Python programming of the systems that are amenable to that. Start looking at the APIs and interfaces of your tools and how they can be programmed to weave together something greater, a uh, whole greater than some of its parts for security operations. Um, so moving along to the next slide, one of the things implicit in increasing the sophistication of defense is that it really highlights the gamesmanship nature of security, which is a lot more like you know, an arms race than other aspects of technology. In many other technology fields, you can progress towards a specific objective achieve that objective and say, your work is done, move on to the next thing, move on to the next evolution of technology, you know, whatever. In security, our roadmap is charted in part, as we've been discussing pretty much throughout this call, by an intelligent adversary. And as the tactics of defense change and improve, you can expect that the adversary's tactics are going to change and improve as well. So another reason why to make the investment in ways that uh, changing tactics can be recognized earlier and better using these techniques, something organizations need to consider. And Nate, I think you have a few points on this uh, on this point as well too. Yes, absolutely. You know, as much as I welcome our robot overlord masters, uh, <laughs> you know, when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to that gamesmanship, uh, you know, I, I think. The next step is, you know, because it's just not going to be limited to malware, but, you know, I expect analytics and machine learning, they're also going to be employed to better track, assess, and target key personnel based upon their public exposure. Um, that can be, you know, their social media, their shopping history, especially coupling that information with just a vast amount of, uh, you know, stolen data records uh, that are out there. Um, you know, when it comes to, you know, how this is going to morph, uh, you know, perhaps uh, these type of capabilities, you know, can be uh, obviously can be uh, useful for um, looking at individuals' data, uh, information, personal information to help with passphrase prediction, uh, correlation of images or audio, like a voice, for example, couple that with uh, someone's identity, as well as behavioral assessments um, against individuals to help them with their phishing uh, uh, campaigns. For example, when is the target the most stressed and more uh, or more susceptible to make mistakes? You know, if uh, big data is good enough to pick out people's life mates online, I suppose it's good enough to aid in the identification and recruitment of those traits most commonly associated with disgruntled employees or those susceptible to uh, bribery or recruitment. 
Um, for example, you know, uh, my credit score is dropping, there's a shift in my tone within social media posts, my streaming media playlists uh, uh, have changed and my online orders for alcohol have doubled in the last month, am I right for <laughs> recruitment, you know? Um, and, and that's just one end, where the other end is also is, you know, what if an adversary especially with regards to supply, and cha uh, supply chain tax, what if they go ahead and you know, grab one of my security technology platforms? Uh, can they reverse that? Uh, can they use that information to uh, help uh, defeat detection? Uh, blue vector leverage is what we call in situ or on-site learning. And basically, the platform learns from our customer's environment and tailors its detection algorithms uh, to that network traffic and the files that it sees. And those files can be very specific to an organization. Uh, you had mentioned earlier, Scott, uh, industrial control systems. Um, those files uh, uh, are often uh, misidentified by traditional detection as being uh, malicious based upon the artifacts inside, how it's packaged, et cetera. Um, you know, there's always the, the nation state threat as well of iBot product X and so can country Y. Um, I assume my, the country Y's offensive capabilities are better funded than my own, as I said earlier. Uh, but with our platforms being um, within the organization and learning from that particular customer's traffic and conditions, uh, as well as the supervised input, uh, that goes into it, in situ learning kind of keeps the bad guys from reversing and defeating a blue vector uh, because his box isn't my box, which isn't, you know, for example, my competitors or someone in my industry verticals box as well. Uh, so I think that's kind of one way where we can look at, hey, different avenues where uh, this gamesmanship comes into play. And the advantages of applying analytics to this sort of approach to alleviate the demand on human expertise. In fact, if we move to the next slide, um, I think we have some uh, specifics here that uh, you want to talk about some of these specifics from uh, this case study, Nate? Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. Uh, all the capability I described today can kind of be found in a single blue vector box that, uh, you know, looking at network metadata, um, we'll be start talking about some additional detection capabilities as well as be able to kind of ingest, um, you know, your own network and host-based signatures and things of that nature. Uh, what that really accounts for, though, in um, being in the you know in our customers' networks, is they're reporting an 80 percent increase in efficiency. Uh, that's a five to one FTE savings. Um, that's significant, uh, as with all the tools and capabilities discussed. I mean, we're really talking about empowering those junior analysts to free up your senior personnel to tackle the larger issues. Uh, I can personally attest to the efficiency savings as I was uh, recently supporting the super uh, computing conference uh, in Denver and having these capabilities on a single platform coupled with the automation that we talked about uh, allowed me to go through 18 hours of alerts in about six minutes. Um, on average, uh, using supervised machine learning uh, and the capabilities within our solution, analytics and things of that nature, our customers are seeing two new malware variants or targeted threats each day. Um, while reducing the amount of time from detection to mitigation for destructive malware. Uh, to be clear, that's communicating through APIs, network to host, uh, as you discussed earlier. Um, but when you raise the point about the two targeted variants every day, that kind of harkens back to a data point that we that used in prior years, and that was one of the tactics that attackers were using to get around uh, defenses of the day in terms of introducing very minor variants of malware um, essentially, you get around what were largely signature-based sort of defenses in the past, but uh, you're seeing this become pretty pretty much common and de facto, it sounds like, in the threat landscape. Absolutely, Scott. So just counting the number of variants isn't as much of a meaningful statistic as it might have been in the past for this reason, and also accentuates why we need technologies to recognize these uh, before they have an impact. One of the areas where we've been seeing uh, quite a bit of um, increased uh, uh, threat activity, as well as interest on the part of the enterprises. Uh, we talk about this on our next slide. We can bring that up, and that's the increased prevalence of what uh, what have been called fileless attacks, meaning attacks that don't rely on malware to do the heavy lifting of, of uh, crafting the exploit that uh, basically cracks open access to something of privilege, something of value to the attacker, gaining access to credentials and uh, wider exposure of the targeted environment. Uh, these are types of attacks that 
rely instead on uh, other tactics. And for this reason, they've sometimes been referred to as living off the land kind of attacks, taking advantage of resources that are already honored native to the target. And again, nothing really new here. Uh, we've had similar types of attacks in the past, uh, particularly at the level of macros and office productivity applications have been gone on, that have gone on for some time. But what this speaks to is that, you know, the ability to recognize malware and malware variants in the engagement of machine learning, it kind of gets back to what we were saying earlier as far as the gamesmanship na nature of security. If you have uh, defenses that are getting pretty good at recognizing malware as the adversary, you're going to want to find ways uh, around that sort of defense. And uh, as a result, we've seen an increase in attacks that do take advantage of capabilities that are already resident on the target or in the targeted environment. Exploits of PDF readers, uh, we've seen those for some time, exploits of JavaScript or Flash uh, in the environment that can be exploited to gain access to a target. PowerShell, uh, having been a very popular topic of discussion, the administrative tool uh, of choice in many uh, Windows-based organizations analogous to gaining root-level access uh, within a non-Windows environment and uh, a command line uh, shell access within those environments. PowerShell delivers a lot of the same functionality for Windows environments. It's a very powerful administrative tool. And moreover, a lot of attackers have cut their teeth in terms of uh, administ IT administrative experience are familiar with PowerShell and its capabilities. So gaining access to its abilities in order to further an attack has been an objective in attacks that we've seen over the past year. And we expect these types of attack variants and attack tactics to continue to become prevalent, uh, to continue to be prevalent uh, in 2018. Um, Nate, you want to talk a little bit about uh, detecting fileless uh, attacks and uh, how you've seen this play out at Blue Vector? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, let's go ahead and cut to the next slide. Thank you. So, um, you know, using fileless attacks, I mean, they're really, like, like you said, Scott, I mean, this is, this is not just a, a cookie cutter approach. Um, for example, you have the calling of scripting languages at runtime, um, as you said, which could be embedded, uh, for example, action script within a PDF file, or even a malicious JavaScript on a web page to redirect uh, users to a hosted payload. Um, additionally, you know, fileless uh, can, can essentially be used to pass commands often visually obfuscated using something like, you know, a base 64 algorithm or even embedding a program subroutine to decrypt the script upon execution in, uh, in memory. Um, once they infiltrate the network, you know, the, the crafty attackers can also, you know, leverage or I should say abuse already installed legitimate programs to lessen their ch uh, chances at being detected. Um, you know, traditional ways of, uh, uh, of detecting this, um, you know, it's few and far between because uh, ultimately what we can pull down is, uh, for example, uh, attackers that want to go ahead and say, hey, uh, I've compromised the host, let me pull down some additional files. Uh, you can get that. Of course, that's not fileless. Um, so uh, with the advent of sandboxes, they've had to move towards scripting, and Blue Vector's patented technology is uh, you know the only solution capable out there of detecting these fileless ma or fileless malware at the perimeter before it enters our organization or your organization. And it does that by emulating the script's actions at line rate. Um, what that means is think of it as taking a file, not executing a sandbox uh, per se, but actually you know going down into the assembly level of a file within milliseconds, uh, and that's and that's our approach. Because um, otherwise what we're seeing is traditional tools, you know, yes, they're catching, you know, automated attack platforms, botnet, script kitties that are pulling down uh, additional software once they compromise, compromise the host, but they're already in at that time, and now you're going to have to go ahead and spawn up or fire up your incident response team. Uh, so we couple our speculative code execution engine um, within, uh, as, uh, within our, our solution as well as network monitoring analytics to help uh, detect the uh, command and control communication that occurs uh, uh, post-breach. Uh, additionally, we have our supervised machine learning um, engine uh, that, as I showed earlier, can help you detect threats 13 months before they're published. Um, all those wrapped together as well as, uh, and I like to harp on this, um, you know, the ability to ingest both network and host-based signatures as well as other indicators of compromise um, to easily flag those known bad, uh, bad actors or files or, as well as their techniques. 
that's um, interesting as far as the predictive capability um, and talking again about uh, the gamesmanship nature of dealing with the adversary. And one of the things that uh, 41 analysts have said that uh, I keep, I, I'm, I'm continuously reminded of is that we've historically been playing checkers a lot, one move at a time in security, whereas we need to be thinking more in terms of chess, getting farther ahead. So, you know, being able to anticipate the moves of the attacker several months ahead is an advantage if you can get that into technology and certainly uh, help alleviate a lot of the demand on teams where not every organization is as well equipped to be able to deal with, you know, the threat intelligence to uh, digest it and apply it to their organization, let alone to be able to consume the volume of threat intel that's available out there. So. Um, some of the tools that you can take advantage of to help you get a better handle on uh, anticipatory moves on the part of the adversary also should be in view for organizations looking at uh, security products and, and the security vendor landscape going into 2018. So we move to the next slide. So just to summarize, um, we expect uh, to continue uh, the vulnerabilities to continue to be some of them more difficult to manage and, and contain than others, and we expect attackers to look at these difficult spots as targets of opportunity uh, within uh, targeted organizations. You now, we've seen the investment in efficiency through the uh, resurgence of worm-like attacks, as in the case of WannaCry, for example, but again, keep in mind the attacker's objective. What is the most efficient way to achieve an objective at the lowest cost with the, with the least amount of risk uh, of being caught or having the attacker compromised themselves? So these are factors that need to factor into an organization's threat model going into 2018, as they have in the past. And because of these issues, we do expect the defense and, yes, prevention, which has uh, gotten something of a bad rep over the last several years, to remain a priority, but the good news being that the advances that we've seen in analytic technologies over the last few years can make a significant contribution to an organization's defensive posture, provided that they can respond quickly and accurately, that they can adapt to current realities and threat landscape and handle scale, and most importantly, reduce the dependence on people to identify, triage, and intervene in an attack before it has an impact on, on a targeted organization. Um, Nate, any final comments in closing before we move to uh, Q&A? Thanks, Scott. Yeah, once again, automate and gain efficiencies, um, eliminating your data silos, consolidating uh, the reporting on your systems, uh, you know, uh, as we were talking about, network programmability, containerization, and machine learning, your friends, Every device on your network and each employee is a potential sensor. Um, you know, really try to move forward and uh, uh, leverage those resources. Thanks, Scott. Absolutely. Um, Chelsea, we have uh, some questions uh, you, uh, directed to us from our audience. We do. Um, so the first question, and I'll let you guys um, kind of tackle this together. You covered it a little bit in the presentation, but do you see any industries being in particular danger of cyber attacks next year? Boy, that's a, that's a really good one. I, I, I'm going to jump into that one first, Nate, and you can feel free to elaborate, but one of the areas I think where we do see a lot of concern is in healthcare uh, going into 2018. Uh, we did a report on industrial controls and ICS security in 20, uh, 2017. We published in the third quarter of this year here at 451. Uh, but we do anticipate that medical and healthcare is going to be uh, much more in focus in the coming year for a number of reasons. We talked about some of these already in the webinar. The fact that a lot of these technologies are um, already in place using systems that are aging, but the, the ability to update and maintain them is limited by, you know, the functionality that has to be verified to not cause problems for patients or be life or health or safety threatening the time it takes to update these systems uh, in concert with making sure that they're compliant with whatever requirements may be in play for medical devices, medical technologies. And the fact that the focus is on the clinical investment, it may not be so much on the defensive investment at a time when healthcare costs are already under significant scrutiny, I think is going to be 
are just some of the factors we expect to shape uh, that uh, market in 2018. And Nate, what are what are you seeing along those lines at Blue Vector? You know, I, I agree with you with regards to medical, especially as we start looking at you know in a, in care or at home patient systems, um, or really for that particular any type of. Uh, uh, control system or, or monitoring system, you know, co- uh, connected to the internet. Uh, I think the reason why, and you had touched on uh, ICS systems uh, previously, but you know, medical and control systems implementations are obviously not really monitored by security pr- uh, practitioners uh, currently, but their implementation um, or their, their their architecting isn't hasn't really involved security folks um, as there's usually you know a different organization, for example, control systems, it's the OT staff um, that, that take lead on that. And um, I think the control system, the ICS networks are slowly starting to gain uh, more awareness and security is starting to creep in. Uh, but that same type of gap, I agree with you, is definitely going to uh, be there for um, adoption of more uh, security within medical uh, solutions uh, until there's more regulation. Yeah, we saw um, in the course of this past year uh, an increase in, in awareness in uh, industrial control exposure coming from a number of quarters. But one thing um, anyone familiar with Shodan saw is that they have a showcase of exposed protocols that's uh, uh, accessible from the homepage directly. And taking a look at that last spring, uh, I was able to find a little over 100,000 systems exposed across a variety of pro- industrial protocols, just taking a very casual look at the Shodan website. Now, that number may have changed and may actually have gone down in part because of that increased awareness, and increased scrutiny. We also saw a big uptick in reported ICS vulnerabilities in 2017. But again, I think that's part of the increased awareness, increased focus on vulnerabilities of industrial control systems, which I think is a good thing because these exposures are out there. At Black Hat, there was a demonstration of the exposure of MQTT and just how prevalent it is because, frankly, it's so simple to implement. And very few security controls typically implemented in a lot of these cases. So while on the one hand, we're going to see increased uh, exposure and potentially increased attack, in these areas, uh, the increased visibility that these exposures are getting, I think, is overall a good thing. Chelsea, we have other questions from the audience? We do. So this next one's a little bit technical, so bear with me, and then we'll see if we can um, get through it together. Uh, how do you see SDN and programmable data planes playing an increasing role in cybersecurity and do you see open flow and P4 runtime as vehicles for achieving this program build, programmability? Um, Nate, I'm going to let you think about the details of that a little bit, and I'll start off with uh, some overall comments. So the question reflects uh, the increasing uh, an aspect of the evolution of IT that we're keeping a pretty close eye on generally at 451, and that's the increasing prevalence of infrastructure as code, if you will, programmable infrastructure, the evolution of the virtualization of infrastructure and its implementation as software, which means that it has become more amenable to being programmed. And that opens some great possibilities for security and potentially opens some risks as well, too. The question is asking about some specific aspects of that. Uh, Nate, I don't know if you want to take on some of the specifics being asked for in that question. Yeah, uh, you know, briefly, uh, you know, protocol and traffic whitelisting, I think, is, is key, especially in the environments of, um, you know, healthcare, uh, control system networks and such. Um, but, you know, the dy- dynamic nature of modern networks, such as, you know, the enterprise, uh, really requires a more modern approach than what we'd be taking. And I'm, I'm very uh, excited about SDN. Uh, I see, you know, a lot of the vendors are embracing that. As far as, uh, you know, network programmability, um, you know, being able to actually uh, respond from as from a security perspective you know the ability to be uh, to touch and respond a particular endpoint or even a network node and redirect traffic to where I want it to be um, versus where you know where it intends to go I think is fantastic especially in the areas of not just uh, responding to, uh, uh, responding to attacks but also in research itself um, you know because uh, I think ultimately 
we've been looking at cybersecurity and you know uh, and threat intelligence as you know, we try to gain the first few bits, but uh, we really don't spend a lot of time looking at the actual TTPs or that's a military term, but techniques, uh, tactics, and procedures um, that the adversary goes through. So whatever we can do to keep an attacker safely within a particular network and allow them to uh, pull down as much tools um, as much. Uh, demonstrate, you know, how, how they actually operate within a particular network, whether it's deception networks or anything of, of those natures, um, I think is I think it's um, exciting. Unfortunately, uh, it's just not standardized yet, so we'll have to see where that goes. All right, great. Thank you, guys. Um, another question, and this one I think is for Nate because it's Blue Vector specific, what's the most common use case for Blue Vector deployment? Uh, so it depends upon the enterprise, um, especially how the enterprise um, segments their network. Uh, we would like to be at the, that gateway. For example, um, you know, uh, if you have a cloud presence, uh, we, we have a cloud offering. Um, we'd like to be not only at the perimeter, but also, uh, you know, in your data center, whether it's a physical platform or, you know, um, thinking of smaller segmentation, you know, uh, as, as a particular VM. Because um, you need to establish a pervasive visibility within uh, your enterprise, and we can help you with that. Uh, additionally, uh, we receive uh, traffic uh, via TAP. Uh, that allows us to stay out of band. Um, one of which um, you don't have to worry about anything, uh, you know, stopping or shutting down your network is very uh, easy to install. Blue vector deployments, 30 minutes. Um, but also, uh, you know, it's very difficult for attackers to be able to uh, impact or manipulate uh, an out-of-band uh, a, a platform. And uh, things like traditional sandboxes usually require an outbound internet, uh, a dedicated internet pop or, or a connection to essentially allow it to pull down additional uh, malware. Uh, the issue with that is, uh, based upon the timing of the hops and things of that, um, bad guys are able to tell if they're being operated in the sandbox and can hide and uh, manipulate that. So we like to be out of band. Um, and of course, um, you know, there are two types of organizations that I've run into, those organizations that like to operate from a SIM uh, or some sort of analytics platform to get that common view. So obviously we'd forward th those all up to either a central manager and then forward into the SIM, or you could operate from an analytics platform such as Splunk. We have a Splunk app or a Q Radar app that allows you to pivot back to the appliance and take action. Um, there's also the organizations that uh, like to do more threat hunting and operate within the platform. Uh, so that would be um, that would be uh, a, another consideration as well. Um, I think the best way is to reach out to us, um, and uh, we can have that discussion about your architecture, how we fit into different integration points, uh, and you know, follow the simple assessment at that point in time. And um, I'll add that you can find out more about Blue Vector at www.elu. V E C T O R dot I O. Um, that's our website, and we walk you through more about how our product works, and you can request a demo and all of that. So, uh, well, I think with that, unless you guys had any other final comments, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, I'll be following up within the next few days with the recording to this, so if you want to rewatch it or anything like that. Um, it'll be available to you. All right. Thanks, Chelsea. Thanks, Dave. Good luck to you in the coming year. Good luck guys. to our audience.